Uh, my name is John Weingart. I'm the Associate Director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics, and I'm delighted and honored to be able to welcome you here this evening to the uh, Lou Gambaccini Civic in Engagement Series event. An event started to um, honor Lou Gambaccini, who was a Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and uh, a leader at, at I'm sorry, Department of Transportation. <laughs> Uh, and in the uh, in an official of the SEPTA and with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and uh, headed the uh, Voorhees Transit Institute at Rutgers University and was a, someone who devoted his life to public service and government service in particular and for whom civics and civic engagement were always very important both in his career and later in encouraging other people. And his uh, family and uh, people from his staff and friends uh, got together and created this this series of events. Um, so we past speakers have included uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Michael Dukakis and, and others, and uh, we're delighted uh, to have Kwame Anthony Apaya here with us this evening. Um, there, we're also delighted that there are a number of people here who were related to Lou Gambaccini in various ways, be either really related by blood or, <laughs> or related by affection. And uh, his daughters, Claire and Sue, are here. So, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and I just add to, to learn more about Lou, um, there's a 90 minute or so interview with him, a uh, recorded interview on the Eagleton Center on the American Governor website, where he reflects on his career and on government service and your. Of course, welcome to watch that anytime you want. Our honored guest this evening is Kwame Anthony Apaya. He has been described as one of our foremost writers on ident identity, culture, and difference, and as an elegant writer and transcendent thinker. He's very influential and highly respected across a very wide intellectual, historical, and geographic terrain. His books include Cosmopolitanism, The Ethics of Identity, a five-volume set he co-edited edited with Henry Louis Gates called Africana, the Encyclopedia of the African and African-American Afro Experience, and his latest work, The Ties That Bind, Rethinking Identity. Dr. Apaya has taught philosophy on three continents, is currently a professor of, geography, of, of philosophy and law at NYU. He was born in London and raised in Ghana received his bachelor's and PhD from Cambridge University. In addition to his teaching and writings, Dr. Apaya has served on the boards of many academic and cultural institutions, including the New York Public Library, the Public Theater, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been president of the Penn American Center and recently chaired the Man Booker Prize jury. In his spare time, <laughs> Dr. Apaya also writes the ethics column that appears each week in the Sunday New York Times Magazine section, where he has responded to questions as timely as, my son's tutor slipped me entrance exam question, oh. should I report him? <laughs> or what should I do about my cheating classmate? To other quandaries that may have bedeviled fewer of us, like do I tell my father that my brother might not be his son? And is it, okay, is it okay to press your spouse to have a vasectomy before you ditch him? <laughs> Those are not, I don't think, the subject of his talk this evening. Dr. Pai's latest book, The, the, the Lies that, that Bind, Rethinking Identity, has been described as a small volume of mighty power, an erudite, personal, timely, and deeply humane work, provocative and brilliant, and a book for our time. It's my honor to introduce Kwame Anthony Apaya. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Thank you all for coming and also <laughs> those of you out there somewhere in the, through the ether. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, for 11 years I was a citizen of the state of New Jersey when I taught at Princeton, so I, uh, and I still have a house uh, about half an hour from here where I'm going after this evening, so I'm a big fan of New Jersey, uh, which is not true of everybody in Manhattan. Um, 
a brown-skinned man gets into a cab and talks with a vaguely British accent. That would be me. If the driver is brown-skinned too, he's often trying, I suspect, to see if we have some sort of affinity. So in the last few months, a Sikh and an Egyptian in New York have wondered where I was born. Now I say in London, knowing that this isn't going to be very helpful, since that's not what they want to know really. What they, what they really want to know is, where do your people come from? Well, I come from two families in two places pretty far apart. By the time I was born, my mother had lived in London off and on since her childhood, but her real home was far away in atmosphere, if not in miles, on the edge of the Cotswold Hills, where she'd grown up on a farm in a tiny and absurdly picturesque village on the border of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. After the Second World War, she found a job in London in an organization that was working for racial harmony in Britain, and uh, it was called Racial Unity, the organization. And that was how she met my father. My father was a law student from the Gold Coast, which was to become Ghana. He was an anti-colonial activist. He was the president of the West African Students' Union, and he was a representative in Britain of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who was to lead Ghana to independence in 1957, just a few years after I was born. So you could say she practiced what she preached. Uh, that is racial unity. Uh, the other side of my family then came from Ghana, more precisely from Asante, a region in the heart of the modern Republic of Ghana, where my father was born in Kumasi, its capital. And my father traced his lineage back to an 18th century general, a successful member of the military aristocracy that created the Asante Empire. And his name, the name of the general, is one of the names that my parents gave me. I'll say it, but you don't have to learn it. It's Akramampim. My book, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity, is full of family stories like these, not just mine, because I wanted to explore the ways in which narratives of this sort shape our sense of who we are. Each person's sense of self is bound to be shaped by his or her own background, but six of the chapters of my book are each focused on widely shared identities, gender, creed, country, color, class, and culture. Why do they matter? Sorry, that's where I grew up. That's the, just a little bit after my ancestor died. That's a meeting of the king of Ashanti and his leading warriors, uh, the chiefs of Ashanti. And these are the six subjects. Um, so uh, now, first of all, why do these matter? And anyway, what do they have in common? After all, look at that list, gender, creed, country, color, class, culture. They, Think about it for a moment, they seem somewhat different. So why do we call all of them identity? What's, what's the story? Well, um, I'm going to say something briefly now about what I think they do have in common. I began my own explorations of this topic many years ago, thinking about race. But when I turned to thinking about nationality and class and culture and religion as sources of identity, and then added in gender and sexual orientation, I began to see three ways in which these very disparate forms of ways of grouping people do have some important things in common. The first is obvious. Every identity comes with labels. So understanding identities requires first that you have some idea about how to apply those labels. That way you can look for someone of the identity or try to decide if you meet someone whether the label fits, whether they're one of those. Not everybody agrees about the boundaries here. Can a Muslim really be French? Some people think not. But there's usually some consensus about some central cases. Uh, nobody doubts that President Macron is French. Uh, nobody in France doubts that. The world is full of people who've never heard of him, so they, <laughs> they, might, they might have a different view. A second point is that membership in an identity group matters for its members' emotions and their deeds. It creates what you might call norms of identification, rules about how you should behave given your identity, given what you are. And one of the commonest ways in which it matters is that people feel some sort of solidarity with other members of the group, other people who share the label. So their common identity gives them reason, they think, to care about and help one another. And that can happen with all of these things. I mean, sometimes two people meet, uh, they come from very far apart, but one helps the other because they're both women. But just as there's usually uh, 
contest or conflict about the boundaries of the group, about who's in and who's out, there's almost always disagreement about what normative significance an identity has. What does being an American require of you? I doubt that we could generate an easy consensus on that in this room or any room in this country. Well, some rooms we might be able to generate an easy consensus. Maybe um, around the Trump dinner table. There's a third feature, though I doubt even there we would uh, find it easy to get to an easy consensus. There's a third feature all identities share. Not only does your identity give you reason to do things, it gives other reason, people reason to do things to you. I've already mentioned something that identity can make people do to you. They can help you just because you share an identity with them. But among the most significant things that people do with identities is use them as the basis of hierarchies of status and respect and of structures of power. In many places in the world, one racial or ethnic group regards its members as superior to others and assumes the right to better treatment and the right to impose worse treatment on others. In some, then, identities come first with labels and ideas about why and to whom they should be applied. Second, your identity shapes your thoughts about how you should behave and feel. And third, it affects the way other people treat you. Finally, all of these dimensions of identity are contestable, always up for dispute, who's in, who's out, what they're like, how they should behave, how they should be treated. Now, this little theory of identity that is summarized in that paragraph I just sketched helped me, as I set out, to think about the particular forms of identity that I mentioned that are the main subjects of the book. And these things are true of all of the ones I mentioned. I'll turn in a moment in talking, to talking about problems in our understanding of one kind of identity, namely class, social class. But first, let me say something about a topic I didn't discuss in the book that wasn't on that list, namely what you might call political identities, since here we are in a place where politics is on the minds of many people. And last summer, the Washington Post published a picture of two men at a rally for President Trump whose matching T-shirts read, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. <laughs> it was something that spoke, I think, to our moment. The Republican brand used to be, I should remind you, rather anti-Russian. But in the Trump era, you can be a Republican Russophile from whom Putin is a defender of conservative values. Um, very, very conservative. American politics, it's become plain, is driven less by ideological commitments than by partisan identities, less by what people think than by what they are. Here, identity seems to precede ideology. Now, for political scientists, this is not news. They've been busily investigating our tribal tendencies in this domain for a long time. Uh, Jim Gimple at the University of Maryland once put it like this, party identification is not opinion, it is identity. And the same goes even for things that people think of as ideological identifications. In research that was published earlier this year, uh, Jim Gimple's colleague, Liliana Mason, conducted a national survey that determined where people stood on various hot button issues, uh, same-sex marriage, abortion, gun control, immigration, health care, and the deficit. Then they were asked about how they felt about spending time with liberals, or if they were, if liberals if they were conservative, or conservatives if they were liberal. And then they were asked whether, what they thought about becoming friends with one. Then they were asked about possibly marrying one. What's interesting was that people's ideological animus, the study found, wasn't best predicted by their opinions, or even by how strongly they held them. It was best predicted by what label they embraced. So, uh, that is particular, whether they embrace the label conservative or the label liberal. Uh, so political psychologists re refer to what's going on here as affective polarization. But what they're talking about is just a way of saying that political cleavages are not so much about disagreeing with people's views. They're more like, as it were, hating your stupid face. <laughs> you can be an ideologue without ideology or without much ideology. Experiments suggest that partisan in-group preferences are extremely powerful today. Americans are, in fact, more polarized by party than they are by race. Indeed, while relatively few Americans are still bothered by interracial marriage, surveys find that between 30 and 60 percent of people who identify as Democrats or as Republicans don't want their kids to marry into the other party. 
That's more than the rates of opposition to interracial marriage a while back, let alone today. Now, this is a feature of people, not so much as of modern politics. Long before anyone instructs children to group people into identities, they're programmed to do it anyway. And one of our basic ways of making sense of the world is to form generalizations of the sort that linguists call generics, generalizations like tick bites give you Lyme disease. These generalizations qualify as true, though it's hard, not easy to say why. For example, do you know what percentage of tick bites transmit the Lyme spirochy? Guess. Less than two. <laughs> But I don't think you're going to go away and conclude from that that you're not going to get Lyme disease from a, from a tick. Um, so, and, and as the philosopher Sarah Jane Leslie, who actually is a dean at Princeton, has argued, we're more likely to accept one of these direct claims if the property it mentions involves a reason for concern, like getting Lyme disease. We're more likely to hold on to the fact uh, if that's so. What's more, generics encourage us to think of the class in question as a sort of group with a shared essence. Uh, to show how this works, Leslie joined with the psychologists Marjorie Rhodes and Christina uh, Tworek, and they designed an experiment in which four-year-olds were shown pictures of a fictional kind of person that they dubbed a zapi. The people in the pictures were male and female, black, white, Latino, Asian, young and old, and they, here's how the experiment went. With one group of four-year-olds, the experimenters used lots of generic remarks. Zarpies are scared of ladybugs, they said, things like that. With another group, they didn't. They avoided using generics. They just said things like, look at this Zarpy. He's afraid of ladybugs, or she's afraid of ladybugs. A couple of days later, they showed the kids a new picture of something they said was another Zarpy and said that he made a buzzing sound. It turned out that the kids who'd heard a lot of generics about Zarpies were more likely to believe that all Zarpies made buzzing sounds whereas the ones who hadn't been encouraged to think of them generically didn't. Generic talk, in other words, encouraged them to think of Zarpies as a kind of person with shared properties, a shared essence, if you like. So we not only belong to groups, that's built into our psychology, as this shows, but we're also easily triggered, of course, to take up arms against other groups. Evolutionary psychologists think these dispositions helped our ancestors survive by creating groups they could rely on to deal with the perils of prehistoric life, including dealing with other groups competing for resources. But these us and them instincts remain an indelible part of human nature. So let's go back to those t-shirts. It's easy to assume that the great majority of Republicans who now support Trump are drawn to his more unpleasant views, and easy to forget that among candidates who led in the Republican primaries, his percentage of the vote was the lowest in nearly half a century. Tribes come to rally behind their leaders, and partisan identification wouldn't be so stable if it didn't follow, if it didn't allow for a great deal of ideological flexibility. That's why rank and file Republicans could go from, we need to stand up to Putin, to, why wouldn't we want to get along with Putin? in the time it takes to say, Trump's in, Rubio's out. So what can we do to take advantage of our tribes without succumbing to the disturbing and debilitating effects of tribalism? Well, for citizens of every divided nation, one of their identities is the national identity. And the theory of democracy is that we, the people, all of us, are charged with directing the ship of state together. Democracy isn't about majorities winning and minorities losing, it's supposed to be a system in which each of us takes responsibility for contributing to the nation's collective welfare. As John Rawls argued, we need to recognize that our fellow citizens with their differing conceptions of the good life must nevertheless treat each other as free and equal people and offer terms of social cooperation that all of us can endorse. So the democratic compact requires us to secure for everyone not just for our own tribe, the rights enunciated in the Universal Declaration or the American Constitution or the Civil War Amendments, freedom of speech, religion and assembly, the right to petition the government, equal protection of the laws, regardless of race, and so on. If you think, as those guys in their t-shirts pretended to think, that you'd rather abandon the nation 
then allow it to achieve some of the aims of the other tribe, you are not in the democratic compact at all. And I'm pretty fat, uh, confident that those guys are, in fact, still in the compact, despite their t-shirts. In pretending to reject our compact, they only succeeded in reminding us of it. They care about America, and thus about Americans, even when they affect to despise so many of them. So what can we do to stick with the compact while caring for our own tribes and their common projects? Well, social psychology teaches us that bigotry towards members of one's own community is something that can be both created and destroyed by the circumstances in which people live together. Long ago, the psychologist Gordon Allport argued for what's called the contact hypothesis. Roughly, it says that contact between individuals of different groups makes hostility and prejudice less likely if it occurs in a framework that meets a few important conditions. Crucially, it must be on terms of rough equality, and it must be in activities with shared goals which are pursued in contexts of mutual dependency. So uh, rough equality, shared goals, mutual dependency. This is one reason that America's racially integrated armed forces turn out to produce people who are less racist on average when they leave than when they arrive. There's lots of data on that. It's this, this fact that the contact hypothesis is so powerfully correct, that makes the segregation of communities within a single society potentially so disastrous. Because segregation makes it unlikely that children will meet and collaborate, acquiring the experience of mutual reliance on terms of rough equality. Now, we can do something about this in principle within the nation by desegregating our communities and our schools. And Americans are used to thinking that we ought to do this to face the challenges of our racial divisions. But our political tribes are increasingly segregated too. So we need to find more spaces where people of our dominant political tribes build the social trust that allows tribes to cohabit while continuing to disagree about important matters. Here's a small fictional story that exemplifies the sort of thing I have in mind. It's a story from Britain. Uh, in the final episode of the first season of the British television series, Skins, which is a group of, about a group of high school students in England, there's a scene at a birthday party of one of the characters, Anwar, who's an English teenager of South Asian ancestry, whose father is a devout Muslim. Anwar's best friend, Maxi, is gay, which um, Anwar isn't. And he's been waiting for Anwar to tell his parents, which Anwar has been afraid to do. So Maxi is standing outside the party, refusing to come in until Anwar tells them. While they're talking, Anwar's father comes out and invites Maxi in. And he says, my wife has made that special spicy curry you like. What are you doing outside here? You're supposed to be inside eating. And as Anwar's father talks, Anwar finally in the background says, dad, Maxi is gay and his father ignores him. So then Maxie himself says, I'm gay, Mr. Corral, I always have been. And there's this long silence, and Anwar waits anxiously to hear what his father will say. And then Mr. Corral says this, which I think is one of the most beautiful speeches that has been pronounced on uh, British television in recent years. It's a stupid, messed up world. I've got my God. He speaks to me every day. Some things I just can't work out, so I leave them be, okay, even if I think they're wrong because I know one day he'll make me understand. I've got that trust. It's called belief. I'm a lucky man. Right, come Maxie, the food is ready. So this is how people are with people with whom they are in this kind of democratic conversation. Mr. Corral belongs to the Muslim tribe, and Maxie's tribe is Christian or perhaps post-Christian, but they do not have to agree about any of that. They have only to accept each other. And they can do that without theories or principles, because being together in the family, eating the curry with his friend's mother over the years, uh, that has generated commitments that can transcend even serious disagreements. And this kind of what you might call cosmopolitan cohabitation is something we all know how to do. We all know how to spend time with people we disagree with. Uh, anybody who has an extended family has done that. But we're all going to bother to do this sort of thing only if we're in conversation with one another already, only if we always have, already have some kind of um, commitment to one another. And that means to build that, you have to share 
thoughts about things you agree about and things you disagree about, big things and small things, uh, football, maybe you think that's a big thing, television shows, maybe you think that's a big thing, movies, uh, and just the sort of gossip you share with people about what's going on at work or in the dormitory. And I think Mr. Corral begins in exactly the right place. He begins by admitting that he can't work out everything, that the world is hard to understand, and that he may not be right about everything. He doesn't abandon his belief that homosexuality is wrong. He just puts it aside as something to be worked on later. Right now, what matters is celebrating his son's 17th birthday with his son's best friend. This works in practice, as this movie, this television show beautifully demonstrates. It does not need a theory. I'm a philosopher, I like theories. But theory isn't the only thing that matters. To accept the ways in which all politics is identity politics is to recognize that high-flown ideas, including a moral commitment to equality, don't matter until they come down to earth. Right now, we need to find ways to draw on our nonpartisan identities, our identities as Americans, as citizens of particular communities, members of churches and synagogues and mosques, to combat the tribalism that is undermining our democracy, for better or worse. It is only through identities that ideas can change the world. Maybe someone should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn then, I actually own this t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I own two of them. Um, let me turn then, finally as promised, to a discussion of one venerable identity that has often been central in modern politics namely social class. In contemporary societies, pretty much everyone is against, of course, the old ways of allocating status through birth. We think that jobs should go not to people who have connections, but to the best qualified, regardless of class, or for that matter, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or a host of other irrelevant identities. Our response <clears throat> to the challenges of class, in other words, has been to endorse the idea that goes by the name of meritocracy. But the word meritocracy was invented by someone who disapproved of it. The thing, meritocracy. He was a man named Michael Young, and he invented the word in a 1958 book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. This was not a sociological tract. It was actually a work of fiction. And it purported to be an analysis written in 2033, looking back at the development of a new British society. In that distant future, unlike the class society of the 1950s, Riches and rule were earned, not inherited. The new ruling class was determined by the formula IQ plus effort equals merit. Narrating from the perspective of that future, Michael Young's fictional alter ego draws conclusions from over what he pretends is half a century of fictional social experience. Today, we frankly recognize that democracy can be no more than an aspiration and have rule not so much by the people as by the cleverest people, not by an aristocracy of birth, not a plutocracy of wealth, but a true meritocracy of talent. That is actually the first published appearance of the word meritocracy, and the book aimed to show what a society governed on that principle would look like, and the results are not pretty. Young's dystopian vision, dystopian vision is of a world in which as wealth increasingly reflects the innate distribution of natural talent and the wealthy increasingly marry one another, society sorts into two main classes in which everyone accepts that they have more or less what they deserve. This is an England in which the eminent know that success is a just reward for their own capacity, their own efforts. As for the lower class, their situation is different. Today, all persons, however humble, know they have had every chance. They are tested again and again. If they have been labeled dunce repeatedly, they cannot any longer pretend. Their image of themselves is more nearly a true, unflattering reflection. The older class societies were sometimes called systems of caste. In one respect, the old societies' classes were like the castes of India. You were born into a structure in India, an exceedingly, exceedingly complex structure of status hierarchies. Occasionally, by some mixture of talent and effort and good fortune, you might rise through the ranks, and occasionally, through ineptitude or laziness or bad luck, you could fall. 
The great revolutions of the late 18th century in France and in North America began a long process of gradually displacing a hereditary ruling class. Uh, remember that our constitution says there shall be no titles of nobility. Napoleon may have reintroduced a monarchy, but even he saw that it, that it should be governed by the ideal, ideal of the career open to talents, the, the, the carrière ouverte au talent, without distinction of birth or fortune. But as Michael Young anticipated, this ideal was bound to conflict with a force in human life that is as inevitable and as compelling as the idea that some individuals are more deserving than others, namely the desire of families to pass on advantages to their children, which you don't need reminding of this week. As he said, nearly all parents are going to try to gain unfair advantages for their offspring. <laughs> I said this in 1959. And when you have inequalities of income, one thing people can do with extra money is to pursue the goal of gaining unfair advantages for their children. I need hardly say that there is nothing wrong in cherishing your children. But a decent society governed by the ideal of merit would have to limit the extent to which this natural impulse permits people to undermine that ideal. If the economic rewards of social life depended not just on your individual talents and effort, but also on the financial and social inputs of your parents, you would no longer be living according to the formula that IQ plus effort equals merit. And Young's apprehensions have surely been proved well-founded. American meritocracy, as the law professor Daniel Markovitz, uh, who's a professor at Yale, argues, quote, has thus become precisely what it was invented to combat, a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across generations. To the extent that you can predict that disproportionately many of the children of the elite will, and disproportionately many of the children of the precariat will not, achieve a position in the top tier of wealth, power, and privilege, you have something too much like the intergenerational transmission of status that marks a system of caste. In Markovitz's view, meritocracy now constitutes a modern-day aristocracy, one might say, purpose-built for a world in which the greatest source of wealth is not land or factories, but human capital, the free labor of skilled workers. Michael Young saw what was happening. Writing at the start of the new millennium, towards the end of his life, he lamented that educational institutions had been enlisted into a newly calcifying force for social stratification. With an amazing batteries of certificates and degrees at its disposal, he observed, education has put its seal of approval on a minority and its seal of disapproval on the many who fail to shine from the time they are relegated to the bottom streams at the age of seven or before. He's talking about examination systems in England. What should have been mechanisms of mobility have become fortresses of privilege. Yet, if a new dynastic system was taking shape, you might conclude that meritocracy has faltered because we aren't meritocratic enough. If talent is capitalized efficiently only in high tax brackets, you could conclude that we simply failed to achieve the meritocratic ideal. You would seek to push more rigorously for merit, making sure that every child has the educational advantages and is taught the social tricks that successful families now hoard for their children. So isn't that the right response? not according to Michael Young. He saw that there would be a problem even if the top class didn't exploit its advantages to give their children chances, chances that were denied to others. The problem wasn't with how the prizes of social life were distributed, or not just that. It was with the prizes themselves. A system of class filtered by meritocracy, in his view, would still be a system of class. It would involve a hierarchy of social respect granting dignity to those at the top, but denying dignity and self-respect to those who did not inherit the talents and the capacity for effort that combined with proper education would give them access to the most highly remunerated occupations. That's why the authors of the fictional Chelsea Manifesto, which in The Rise of the Meritocracy is supposed to serve as the last sign of resistance to the new order, uh, that, that uh, asks for a classless society. The classless society would be one, I'm quoting, which both possessed and acted upon plural values. Were we to evaluate people not only according to their intelligence and their education, their occupation and their power, but according to their kindness and their courage, their imagination and sensitivity, their sympathy and generosity, 
there could be no classes. Every human being would then have equal opportunity to develop his own special capacities for leading a rich life. Class identities in a meritocracy reduce people to a single measure of worth, the argument runs. And only someone with a very limited vision could suppose that human worth reduces to a single measure. And so the uh, manifesto proposes an alternative vision in which we recognize many forms of excellence. The ideology and mechanisms of meritocracy, then, can lead us to conflate two different concerns. One is a matter of efficiency. The other is the question of human worth. If we want people to do difficult jobs that require talent, education, effort, training, and practice, we are going to need to be able to identify candidates with the right combination of talent and the willingness to exert themselves and provide them with incentives to train and practice. So we will design schools and universities and select people to fill the places in them. And if the institutions are working properly, they aren't merely handing out credentials, which is always a danger, they're building human capacity. We then allow for entrepreneurship, social and commercial, and we offer jobs with salaries and other advantages, interesting work, respect and autonomy in your job, vacations, pensions, healthcare, and we select people to fill them as well. We open careers in Napoleon's formulation to develop talent. But in the end, there will be a limited supply of educational and occupational opportunities, and we'll have to find ways of allocating them. As intelligent machines dominate more and more activities, the supply may grow scarcer. At school and work, we will have to use some principles of selection to match people to positions. Those principles should be designed so that the educational system produces the supply of people who have the right trainings, and the jobs end up being done by people who are prepared to do them. Of course, both the jobs and the schools must do more than make people useful to others. Work needs to have meaning. Education needs to prepare you for life as a citizen and as a private person, as someone living a valuable human life, and not just as someone earning a living. Such considerations must be taken into account in selecting people for schools and colleges and the world of work. If these principles of selection have been reasonably designed, we can say, if we like, that the people who meet the criteria for entering the schools or getting the jobs merit those positions. That is, to enlist some useful philosopher's jargon, a matter of institutional desert. People deserve these positions in the sense in which people who buy winning lottery tickets deserve their winnings. They got them by a proper application of the rules. Institutional desert, however, has nothing to do with the intrinsic worth of the people who get into college or who get the best jobs. Any more than lottery winners are people of special merit, and losers are somehow less worthy. Even if we are going to reward hard work, the capacity for hard work is itself the result of natural endowments and upbringing. So neither talent nor effort, the two things that would determine uh, rewards in the world of the meritocracy, is itself the, something you have earned. Someone who, as the rise of the meritocracy bluntly put it, has been repeatedly labeled dunce, still has capacities and aptitudes, and still has the challenge of making a meaningful life. The lives of the less successful are not less worthy then, but not because they are as worthy or more worthy. There simply is no sensible way of comparing the worth of human lives. However the dice fall, people will inevitably want to share both money and status with those that they love, seeking to get their children financial and social rewards. Inheritance laws permit us to transfer money to our children. Class lets us transfer status through the educational system, enlarging their cultural capital, and permits us by sharing connections to enhance their social capital. But we shouldn't secure our children's advantages in a way that denies a decent life to the children of others. Each child should have access to a decent education, suitable to her talents and her choices as they both develop. Each should be able to regard him or herself with self-respect. Historically, we have used inheritance taxes to help even out some of these opportunities. Further democratizing the opportunities for advancement is something we know how to do, even if in the current state of our politics in Britain and the United States, it's not very likely that it will be done anytime soon. But we also need to work to do something that we don't quite know how to do, which is to eradicate the contempt for those who are disfavored by the ethic of effortful competition. 
The goal isn't to eradicate hierarchy and to turn every mountain into a salt flat. We live in a planetude of incommensurable hierarchies, and the circulation of social esteem will always advantage the better novelist, the more important mathematician, the uh, savvier businessman, the fastest runner, the more effective social entrepreneur. We can't fully control the distribution of economic, social, and human capital or eradicate the intricate worry patterns that emerge from these overlaid grids. But class identities don't have to uh, uh, internalize these, what one sociologist calls these injuries of class. And it remains an urgent collective endeavor to revise the ways we think about human worth in the service of moral equality. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, first of all. Um, so for your book, you made a methodology of six different forms or six different things that stem from identity. Um, you know, color, I believe I believe one of them was color. It was yes. uh, color. gender, class, so on and so forth. Um, but as everyone knows, I mean, these things often intersect. No, not often. Everyone's an exception to it. Not everyone's just a woman. Not everyone's just a... Uh, Mexican, not everyone's just uh, Republican. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I just wanted to ask you, what's the usefulness of distinguishing between all of these, all of these types of aspects that come from identity if everyone's kind of just an exception to them, if everyone's not fully one thing or another? Good. Um, so, um, one of the points the book tries to make is that we have these sort of stereotypes associated with each of these identities and that everybody, uh, everybody, even the people who we think of as the typical whatever, uh, is uh, um, that, that, that any of these groups is internally diverse, not least because it's internally diverse along the dimensions of the other forms of identity. So some women are black, some are white, some are uh, straight, some are gay, and so on. Uh, some are American, some are not. Uh, so. Um, but that, those, um, uh, the fact that these labels uh, don't go with essences that uh, predictably uh, uh, allow us to uh, know what a person of a particular identity will be like doesn't mean that they teach us nothing. Uh, and um, as long as we remember that for when it matters that um, not all women are the same, not all men are the same, and so on, as long as we remember it when it matters, uh, there are many contexts in which it's harmless and perhaps even sometimes useful to think of all the members of the group together and to act together as Americans say or as New Yorkers or as New Jerseyans uh, to do things. So um, the, the idea is to allow that the labels matter, that they convey some information, though usually less information than people think, um, and that they can be useful in various social activities while keeping um, clear about the fact that you mentioned, uh, which is that uh, within each of these large groups there is a great deal of internal uh, inhomogeneity, a great deal of, of, of diversity. Um, I, I mentioned that it's possible for t you know, two women from very far apart to come together as women to do something. That's something that happens in the world. Uh, they do that not least because uh, if, if it works, they recognize that they are not the same. They're both women, but one of them is from a rich country, one is from a poor country, one is a Muslim, one is a Christian, and so on. And nevertheless, they can use the, the identity label woman to do work, to help them to do something with and for each other. So your point is absolutely crucial. It's absolutely crucial not to be essentialist about these forms of identity, not to think that uh, having one of these labels apply to you means that you are exactly like everybody else to whom the label applies. 
And one of the reasons why that is, is because of the point that I stressed, which is that there's contest, of course, about the very nature of the identities. Who are the real French? Les Français de Souche, who are, who are the real French, the, the base French? Does it include now some people of Algerian ancestry or not? Does it include some people from the Antilles uh, whose ancestors came from Africa or not? Uh, the Académie Française uh, contained, until he died, the former president of Senegal, Leopold Sédar Songo, because the only criterion for being a member of the Académie Française is that you should write beautiful French. And he was one of the great French poets of the 20th century. So, um, so those people thought, yes, it was obvious that this man, who actually had the passport of Senegal, as well as the passport of France, um, was, a, was, a, was, was a Frenchman. They, they claimed him. Uh, but other people in the very same country, of course, would not. So I think, um, and in order to understand that phenomenon, the phenomenon of the contest over the label, you have to see that essentialism won't do. Because if essentialism were right, there would be a correct answer. Right? There would be some thing, some properties you had to have, and if you had those properties, you'd be French, and that would be the end of the matter. But that isn't how these social identities are. There's contest. There's contest about gender. How many genders are there? I mean, people disagree about that. Uh, is, um, uh, what's the Kardashian uh, relative called? Jenner. Jenner. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner. Is, is Caitlyn Jenner a woman? Some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, um, and so on. Um, uh, I was giving a talk the other day on, in connection with the anniversary of Stonewall at uh, NYU, and um, somebody in the audience got up and said that it was still the case that, um, that people said LGBT all the time, but they didn't really take much account of bisexuals. And he was speaking for a bisexual group saying, come on, we've got to, if you're going to say LGBT all the time, you better include us. And he pointed out. Um, correctly, that there are probably more bisexuals than the other LG and T. Uh, and so maybe, maybe it would be a good idea to include them because you've got a bigger group that way. Um, so, so I think these, these contests are part of the reason why essentialism, I don't want, I mean, I have a view about Caitlyn Jenner, but I don't think as an analyst I should declare my view to be the correct view. I think I should understand why there is contest about these things and why, therefore, while I have a view about it, uh, it's only one of the possible views. And um, I'm going to try and persuade other people around to my view, and I think more and more people are coming around to what, I, to what seems like my view, but uh, at least I think they're coming around to what looks like my view. But, um, but that needs social work. I mean, one of the points I didn't make in this talk, which is really important, I think, is that these identities, because there are these contests and, and arguments, um, one thing we need to do in social life is talk to one another about these what we disagree and don't agree about, back, back to the political case. Um, we, we need to be, um, gender doesn't belong to anybody in particular. Gender doesn't belong to women, it doesn't belong to men, it doesn't belong to cis people, it doesn't belong to trans people, it belongs to everybody. And if it's to work, it has to work for all of us. And so we need to engage in dialogue with one another in order to shape these identities so that they do work for all of us. Just to put an exclamation point on the question and your response, he is indeed from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> but not just in Mexico. Yes. Um, other? Aiden. Aiden. Just say, say your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Aiden. I'm a student here at Rutgers. I'm from Bergen County. Um, so my question is, in e examining the parents, parents, what's wanting, what's best for their, for their children, often at the expense of other less advantaged um, children, what is the best sort of public policies that we can implement to circumvent to this dream hoarding? Well, it needs a lot of different public policies. I mean, we were talking about this over dinner, but it, it needs, you know, we need um, universal uh, antenatal care for children because some of your capacities are shaped by whether you're looked after properly, or your mother is looked after properly when you're in utero. Uh, we, need, we need, obviously, a better preschool for some people uh, who don't have access to it or who have access to in, uh, inadequate preschool. We need, uh, and so on, right, through the system. Um, so, um, and, you know, you know but, uh, you know, as is very evident from this story this week about the, 
the, the cheating uh, on uh, college admissions. Um, the, the, the deeper problem is that um, uh, people believe, and they may be right, that it makes a very big difference which of these opportunities you end up getting. If, now, I happen to think, and this thought is based on analysis and evidence, not just a hunch, it's based on the work of Alan Kroger, who's a very distinguished economist who was President Obama's chief economic advisor and is a professor at Princeton. I happen to think that there's pretty good evidence that if you take people with the same rough scores and to put one of them at the University of Pennsylvania and the other at Penn State, their life chances are going to look pretty much the same, economically speaking, 20 years on. It turns out, but everybody thinks, apparently, that if you can afford it, Penn's the better option. Now, my, one of my best friends, I wrote a book with her, is the president of Penn. I have nothing against Penn. But uh, I think she would agree with me that we have an exaggerated sense uh, we have a society in which there's an exaggerated sense of the significance of the differences uh, between uh, the kinds of educations you get at the places which have the big neon lights on them and the places that don't. Um, but um, what is true is that it does make a difference uh, if you're uh, at the, you know, the, as it were, somewhere, towards, somewhere in the top part and somewhere in the bottom part. I mean, it makes a difference. Uh, some, some difference, and it makes more difference than it should. That is to say, we could make the, the educations at the bottom better. Uh, and, um, you know, I used to teach Princeton. Uh, Princeton has an endowment per student, which, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's unclear to me that in a just world, uh, that much resources would be devoted to in a just world where there are people going to um, uh, community colleges that need resources, that, that, that much money would be devoted just to those kids there at Princeton. If we're going to do that, we should allocate those, those opportunities fairly. We shouldn't hoard them for people who bribe uh, coaches, which is not, not an accusation made against Princeton. Um, but, um, but maybe we shouldn't, <laughs> maybe the whole thing's not quite right. And remember, this is um, our, this is not just a question for the Princeton trustees, because the, the fact that they can do that is itself the result of the way our tax laws work uh, and, and decisions we make, and the fact that, um, for example, this very, very rich institution gets lots and lots of grants for the National Science Foundation, because it has very good scientists. But maybe you shouldn't give public money to very rich private institutions. <laughs> Uh, who could afford to uh, fund serious research anyway? I mean, um, they'd have worse professors probably because for various reasons to do with the prestige of the way prestige system works in science, you want to be someone who gets National Science Foundation grants. But my point is uh, that question isn't a question for the Princeton trustees. It's a question for us as citizens. Do we want, do we want to run the system the way it is? And we don't think very much about these things, I think. We sort of take it that this is how it's done. Um, but look, the Ancien Regime was how it was done, right? That was Louis XIV, that was a king. Uh, maybe we, that wasn't such a great way to do things. So I think um, we, should, we should be imaginatively reflecting on whether we think that the way we're doing it now is adequately reflective of the fact that every human being in our society matters. Uh, and is entitled to access to the kinds of resources that will mean that they can have a decent and dignified human existence. And a lot of what we do doesn't seem guided by that thought. Yeah. Good evening, my name's Avinash. I'm a sophomore here at Rutgers studying political science. And my question is more based around, I suppose, the greater capitalist structure that we live in. Is, is it inherent that living in this type of society that we live in, that money is that great divider? And then if that is the case, then how do we disengage people from chasing it? My roommate, for example, as you know, already investment banking is very limited to those top elite schools. But here at Rutgers, he feels he has that opportunity. But he, every day, he's grinding for next summer, that incoming summer analyst at Goldman Sachs. After that, full-time working at Goldman Sachs. That is the dream. That is the route that he's planned out for himself. Is it wrong to inherently seek out that wealth? in some sense? Well, 
Um, if he tells Goldman Sachs it's what he's after, they probably won't let him in. Because they, Goldman Sachs, as it happens, thinks of itself as a place that wants smart, imaginative people who will get rich on the way, but they're more interested in the smart, imaginative people than in the people who show up just wanting the money, I'm told. Uh, uh, I mean, I've talked to partners at Goldman Sachs about exactly this question. So, um, I mean, there is a question about why so many people at schools which have high prestige are aimed at uh, investment banking and consulting. Um, that's more than half the, I don't know the numbers at Rutgers, but it's more than half the graduating class at Princeton. That's ridiculous, um, I think. Uh, and so we're doing something wrong if we are persuading people that that's what they ought to be doing. Not because there's anything wrong with investment banking, but because uh, it can't be the case that investment banking is the best thing for half the Princeton graduating <laughs> class to be doing. There must be better things for at least some of them because they're different. They're not all the same. And what's a good life as an investment banker depends upon being a certain kind of person and having certain kinds of interests. And if you don't have those interests, it's not going to be a good life for you. And you should be more imaginative <laughs> about what kind of life will be good for you. So, um, so we need to do an educational job, I think, of um, a better job of um, explaining that the object of the exercise isn't actually to get um, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money, that that's, uh, we ser everybody needs enough money. And maybe that's a lot. But it isn't um, the tens of millions of dollars that the typical uh, successful Goldman Sachs banker ends up with. So uh, we don't need that much. Um, and, and, and we are a society which keeps score, I think, too much by money, and also by the things that money can buy, which include political access and so on. And the, the, the role of money in g gaining political access is a problem because we're supposed to be a democracy. And, uh, and in, so we're not meant to be a plutocracy. We're not meant to be a society in which things are run in the interests of the people with the most money. Um, and again, these are things we can do something about if we want to. Uh, we aren't going to do anything about it very quickly because right now we are a plutocracy, <laughs> uh, at least as much as we're a meritocracy. And, and that means that since it's not in the interests of the plutocrats uh, to make us less plutocratic, it will take something more revolutionary than people like me talking um, to get something done. But I think, I think you know, these arguments are, need to be made. We need to think more about why we allow um, why it's the case that both the Democratic and the Republican parties too often do things that look like they're just ways of hoarding various kinds of privilege that are already quite heavily hoarded by, by um, financial elites. My, um, my mother's father was the British uh, finance minister in the Labour government after the Second World War, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I'm proud of the fact that he introduced a tax on estates over a million pounds uh, which was one of the reasons why um, that huge concentration of wealth in the landed aristocracy began to decline in the 1950s. And those, those people, there's nothing wrong with those people, but they weren't entitled to a monstrously large share uh, just because they happened to have been born to people who, whose ancestors had the monstrously large share, I think. But these are things, you know, people disagree about this, so I th these are the sorts of things that politics is about, arguing about those questions. Awesome. Getting Goldman Sachs may be seen as the best path to becoming governor in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's a job everybody wants. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, my name's Aaron. Uh, Hi, Aaron. I just wanted to say, uh, Cosmopolitanism was uh, one of the first philosophy books I read, and uh, I went on, on to major in philosophy. Um, so it's very exciting. I reread the book in anticipation. Very excited oh, to, great. Thank you. to be here and hear you speak. Um, uh, so my question uh, is about the multiple identities that we have. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, what you think about how they interact. Um, so for example, um, I have an identity. I'm from New Jersey. Um, I'm also a member of the millennial generation. 
Um, so uh, one day, am I wearing my New Jersey hat and I'm taking in the world as a New Jersey and another day I'm a millennial? Or does everyone kind of have a unique concoction that they take everything in as? Um, so there's, what, seven or eight billion people now. Uh, two to the 32 is around about eight billion or so. So you only need 32 identities to make everybody distinct. <laughs> and that's binary identities, and most identities aren't binary. Uh, I mean, people argue about whether gender is binary, but nationality certainly isn't binary. There's 192 members of the United Nations. So it's pretty easy to get everybody a unique combination uh, of these things, because there's a lot of them. Um, and uh, the way in which I think, I mean, the answer to your question about how they sort of work is that um, th th uh, I think that they sort of take salience in different deliberative contexts. So that when you are thinking about electoral politics, uh, sometimes you'll be interested in generational questions about the debt that your generation has been asked to bear for an education that was um, much less burdensome in its costs for the generation before. And sometimes you'll be thinking as a New Jersey, and you'll be thinking, should the state of New Jersey, how much should the state of New Jersey be spending at Rutgers? Um, uh, should it be spending more, or should it be distributing the money uh, through the New Jersey educational system at the tertiary level in different ways, right? I mean, so you already know that your identity comes to bear in different ways in different contexts. Well, I think one of the things, when I, I said that thing about, um, you know, how um, some things work in, in practice and they don't need to work in theory, um, I think people are pretty good at this. They're pretty good at handling multiple identities and seeing that in this moment what matters is that I'm gay and in this moment it matters that I'm a woman and this moment it matters that I'm a member of this family, in this moment it matters that I'm Jewish. I think people are pretty good at that. Um, um, and I think, on the other hand, when people look at other people, they think it's very hard. They, they, they don't trust them to manage it properly for themselves, right? Uh, you're, you're both uh, uh, African-American and American. Uh, does that mean you have divided loyalties? Well, um, uh, the United States and the African-American community are not going to go to war. So you don't have to decide which army you'll be in. Uh, uh, and so the idea that, um, where, whereas African Americans are perfectly good at handling this, sometimes they're mad at America, as Frederick Douglass was on the 4th of July, and sometimes they're delighted to be Americans and very happy because they're hanging around with other Americans and having a holiday in Italy. So, um, or being in the Democratic Party together and working to advance the causes of justice, uh, or a Republican Party together doing whatever they do. Um, <laughs> So, um, I don't know, I never meet any, so you know, I'd, I'd like to know. Uh, the, the evidence from their public behavior is a bit mis mystifying to me. Um, so, I think people are pretty good at this, pretty good at, uh, uh, and when you do have difficulty, it's probably because there's a genuine difficulty, right? It's because there's something genuinely difficult to puzzle out. Uh, and, and so, uh, I, I, and, but I think that the point that these things are contextual, that, that it depends on what the issue is, what seems relevant in your identity, um, and, that, um, and also that they interact in ways that are some quite regular and, and some irregular. Uh, that, that those are two important points about, about the sort of logic of the interaction of, of identities. I mean, th this thing about, you know, sort of conflicts is particularly common apropos of cosmopolitanism, people are particularly inclined to say to cosmopolitans, well, you can't, you have to be either a citizen of the world or a citizen of the United States. Um, to which I'm inclined to say, you have to be either a citizen of the United States or a citizen of New York. <laughs> you can't fiddle faddle about pretending to be both of those things. Well, you can. And um, because the world isn't going to war, be at war with the United States, you don't have to choose which army you're going to be in. Right, so being a citizen of the world is not a matter of signing up for the armed services of the world. Um, so, and again, I think people are pretty good. The, uh, some of the time, as citizens, that is, in our taking responsibility for our lives as citizens of the United States or the state of New Jersey, picking a senator, say, um, 
we need to think about the rest of the world because we do things that have big impact on the rest of the world. And so you need to be responsible as a citizen of the world as you are being responsible as a citizen of the United States. Uh, and that's just, and again, it's not hard, it turns out. I mean, there may be hard cases, but in general, people are pretty good at this. And interestingly enough, um, the BBC did some polling a couple of years ago, or had somebody else do some polling for them, and they asked people in many countries, Nigeria, China, Brazil, United States, this question, do you feel more of a citizen of the world or more of a citizen of your country? And the amazing thing is that the country where the lowest number of people said, I feel more um, citizen of the world, was Russia, and it was 20-something percent. In Nigeria, it's 60 percent. And in China, it's, I forget, in the 50s. So huge numbers of people in the world are managing being citizens of lots of places while still thinking of themselves as citizens of the world. And, and it's working fine. So, so I think that the, as I say, it's genuinely theoretically difficult to think about how to map the intersections of identities, which is sort of where you started out. And I agree that that's a very, but I, I think it's important to insist that most people are managing this pretty well most of the time. And when they aren't, it's because th there's some serious problem in their lives. You know, you're Jewish, it's 1935, you're in Germany. Well then, what am I? That's a really serious question. You better get the answer right. So I want to ask you about uh, racial identity yeah, specific. Racial. Sorry? Like you are, oh, I'm Vinay. I'm a junior studying philosophy here. I read some of your work in a class uh, last year. Okay. Uh, and so I want to ask you about race specifically and to what extent does um, being part of a race uh, entail a uh, special obligation to other people in the race, if at all? Um. I think my view about that is that uh, it, it depends um, because um, racial uh, identities have saliences, very different kinds of ethical saliences in very different uh, societies. So uh, it, I don't think, for example, that my mother, who was English and white, um, ever needed to think about that fact for the last 50 years of her life when she was living in Ghana. It wasn't, uh, she didn't have to think about special obligations to white people uh, who showed up, um, or British people even, but certainly not to white people, uh, because there was no reason to. There was no, uh, 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 white people aren't treated badly in Ghana, so there was no group to gather solidarity with in order to defend your rights and so on. So in that context, I don't think she had any reason to uh, to think of herself as having special obligations to. But if you are if you're a member of a racial minority group in a society that's oppressive, um, um, treating the responsibilities of trying to do something about that oppression uh, as a serious matter, which is going to involve special concern for other members of the group, I think is something that you ought to think about very seriously because um, if other people are doing it, then you're free riding on their work. Um, and in general, I, f I feel it's an important moral idea that when you are in a group and the group is benefiting you, then you owe your fair share of sourcing the benefits. That's true of countries. You shouldn't free ride on the many things that your country gives you. Your country gives you all kinds of things, uh, security, order, highways, a healthcare system, uh, a tax system that is somewhat redistributive, often in the wrong direction in our society, but still. Um, so it gives you many things, and, and as a result, uh, I think you should contribute your fair share to the sustenance of them. And, and that is true of racial identities in racially divided societies where there's a project of racial uplift to be done. This does not let anybody else off the hook um, about the racial injustice. Uh, uh, white people have a duty to make sure that their society is not racially unjust to black people as well. 
But I think there is a special kind of uh, obligation that comes from the fact that other people in your group are doing the work of um, uh, um, helping to solve whatever the racial burdens are that you face. Which means, um, which what this suggests is that white people have no special obligation to other white people because there isn't such a task. I mean, I guess if you're a white supremacist and you think that's a good thing, you should contribute your fair share to the sustenance, sustenance of white supremacy. But since white supremacy is a bad thing, um, you shouldn't do that. Um, but if there were contexts in which white people were systematically uh, uh, oppressed, uh, as there might be in some places, in those contexts, the same thing would apply to them. Notice that this suggests that the relevant way of understanding the racial group is indexed to a sort of local context. So um, uh, this doesn't suggest to me that African Americans have a special obligation to do something about Ethiopia on the grounds that Ethiopians are also black. Uh, because the, uh, on the other hand, W. B. Du Bois thought the opposite of what I just said, but that was because he thought that racism was a global phenomenon and that it was only by people of color around the world working together that it could be resisted. If you thought that, then you would have to think as a person of color that you should uh, bear your fair share of the burdens of the project of racial uplift, which is what he thought. Right behind you. I'm Sue Gambaccini, um, daughter of Lou Gambaccini. Um, along the same lines of what you were just talking about, I mean, you said, well, what, you know, do white people have an obligation to other white people? Well, how about just the context of the great inequality in our country? So, you know, um, don't we have an obligation to want to help the poor? Oh, yes. But, you, but I think your obligation to them is as Americans, right. not as white people. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. But yes, no, I think nationality is one of the great sources of um, uh, obligations of partiality, of special obligation to, uh, to people. Uh, and that's why um, you can't have a, you can't think of your citizenship too abstractly. It has to be a thing of the heart as well as of the head because, because it rightly calls on you to, 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 to pay your share of sustaining the life of your community. And um, people don't do that sort of thing except out of, they, they do it from the heart and the belly more than from the head. I mean, you need the head to guide the heart, but, but you need the heart as well. One thing, and the reason why this lecture series exists is because my father, um, you know, grew up uh, in the 30s and 40s and um, believed that even though he was in a career in transportation, that his first love was the whole idea that we all should be active citizens and not just take the um, rights, but, you know, contribute to the responsibilities of mm -hmm. being a citizen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think this general idea that uh, uh, the nationality um, has, I mean, so the citizenship is a sort of legal status, but then there's this nationality. This is the feeling of belonging together with the other people in the country and, and the concern for them. That, um, precisely because um, the, the country's doing so much for you, whether you realize it or not, uh, it's, it's great, all this huge amount of uh, physical capital and intellectual capital and social capital and cultural capital that your society surrounds you with and makes possible your choices about who I'm going to be, how I'm going to live and so on. All of that you owe to your society. So um, you, you, it's just wrong, it seems to me, to accept all that and not recognize that you owe your share of sustaining it to you. And that, that seems to me, that's. It's um, a fortiori true in the case of the nation, but it's true about other groups. It's true, it's true of your church, your, uh, your, your, your mosque, and so on. These are all your religion, 
uh, it's doing something for you, and that's only possible because other people are doing things, and you owe your fair share, it seems to me. Not everybody agrees. I mean, this is a philosophically controversial uh, claim I'm making, but it's what I believe. Hi, I'm, I'm Jean. I'm uh, on staff here at the Eagleton Institute. Thank you so much for coming. I actually have some question about technology and how that plays into identity. Because it was supposed to, you know, the internet age is supposed to be this great democratizer, like we're all connected, we're global citizens. But it also, in the echo chambers of social media, it reinforces partisanship. It's reinforcing sometimes the negative side of identity, but also the positive sides of it. And then, you know, so that's one piece of it. And then there's, you know, the rise of AI and what does that mean in terms of intrinsic human value and what we are, like our identity as people and all that. So that's kind of a very broad area, but I would just love to hear your ruminations on technology and what that means for us as right. you know, our human identity. Well, I think you're right to say that um, the way social media work, works um, does have positive as well as, I mean, sometimes we focus a lot on the negative side and the echo chambers and, and the, just the nastiness uh, of, of Twitter or something like that. But, uh, but we should also remember that it's enormously empowering and enabling for all kinds of people around the world. I'm just talking to somebody beforehand. Um, think about the situation of a Ugandan, a gay woman in U Uganda, a lesbian in U Uganda. That's a society where people are being killed for being gay at the moment, um, unfortunately encouraged by American evangelical Christians. I mean, not all of them, but, but some of them. And having the web, having social media as a place where you can be safe uh, to communicate without other people knowing that you're communicating with uh, um, gay rights groups in other countries, but also other gay people in Uganda, is an enormously enabling thing. And Think of the situation of women in Saudi Arabia. Again, uh, the, the, the web is enormously positive for many things. So we, I don't think we should lose track of, of the positive side. But of course, um, the, um, the sort of toxic partisanship that I was talking about is definitely some of that is, I think, um, uh, exaggerated by, by the web. I think um, maybe Twitter should be designed so that you have to take three days off every so often this year. <laughs> Allow you to cool down and stop being so mad. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that is, um, look, it's a new technology and societies take time, it's a new intellectual technology. It, societies take time to adjust. Think of how, think of the enormous impacts of uh, either writing, which changed human society forever, or print. Uh, no print, no reformation. Uh, no individual, ordinary people reading the Bible for themselves. No Protestantism. Uh, well, that was a pretty big, <laughs> pretty big uh, thing. Um, uh, the radio, lots of impacts. Uh, in, in, in colonial Africa, the radio created, uh, for example, uh, um, shared versions of languages that existed in huge collections of dialects and created, allowed people to form the versions of, to listen to forms of language that they could understand or learn to understand, and then to have a language they could all talk to each other. So um, lots of, you know, uh, but this is, you know, this is relatively new, this situation, and we haven't quite learned the, some of the things we had to learn in order to, you know, print took a while for us to develop copyright as a way of incentivizing the creation of material in print. It took us a while to balance out. I mean, Milton, Areopagitica, is about um, <laughs> uh, censorship. It took us a while to figure out if everybody's reading, how much should the government censor, right? Uh, governments, to begin with, thought more or less everything. Um, it was still the case when I was a teenager in London, I used to go to the theater quite a lot, that every play that was put in London had to be read and approved by the Lord Chancellor. And there was a big question of whether they were going to approve Boys in the Band. So, um, so that's, that's several hundred years after the invention of, of print, though not after the invention of the plays, thousands of years after the invention of the play. So I think we need to 
give ourselves time to figure out how we're going to handle these things, but we sh should recognize the problems you identified. O on the sort of, as it were, the rise of the robots problem, which is another big thing. I mean, that I think, um, like immigrants, uh, robots create jobs as well as taking them away. Um, lots and lots of people are doing things now because there are robots. But lots of people are not doing what they used to do because there are robots. And on the whole, I think that um, resisting the rise of the robots is not a good idea, in part because one thing the robots are doing, one thing is they're taking away tasks that human beings don't really want to do, some of them. or I mean, they, they did them, but they didn't, they'd rather not be doing them. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to index my books. <laughs> but but uh, if I just use Word properly, I can send them to the index the publisher like that. So there are lots of things that are terrific that the robots are doing. But, um, and one of the things they're doing because of, for example, so that's taking away jobs from indexes. But it's increasing the speed and the lowering the cost of me producing books. Uh, or at least my contribution to the production of my books, which is a small part by comparison with the part of the printers and the copy editors and so on. Um, that, um, so that's creating wealth. It's creating new wealth. The problem isn't that, I think. It's that we aren't sharing the new wealth properly. That's not a problem about the robots. That's a problem about the organization of society. And if we, just as I, I'm a big fan of immigration, I'm a big fan of globalization. But uh, and in, in part because they have created huge amounts of wealth, both of them, for, for everybody, not just in this country but elsewhere. Immigration is good for the countries people come from as well, as, as it, it's good for us. So that's all good, and it's produced huge amounts of wealth, but we haven't used it as we should have to spend some of it on looking after the people whose jobs have been taken away, looking after the people in the, the, the post-industrial spaces of our society. We have plenty of money for that. We've, that's one of the things that globalization has done. It's created huge amounts of wealth, but it's all sitting in the hands of, you know, half of it's in the hands of billionaires. Um, and some of the billionaires are spending some of it on dealing with these problems, very nice of them. But really, it's a social problem, and we should be dealing with it as a society, not leaving it to Bill Gates to, to sort of tinker with little bits of it. Um, Good as that is, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not against his doing that, but I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a collective responsibility and we haven't been doing it. And here, I mean, I, I've no doubt sounded somewhat like a partisan Democrat, but here I want to say that this is absolutely a shared failure of our elites. It's not a democratic failure, it's not a republican failure, it's just a total failure of our elites to pay appropriate attention to these problems. And, I think one reason they haven't is because when you're nodding, which is good, I'm glad you agree with me, but you're, th but, but you're thinking of politicians. I don't think that's actually the problem. Um, I think the problem is that, um, I'm the son of a member of the Ghanaian parliament, the grandson of a member of the British parliament, and a great grandson of a member of the British House of Lords. Uh, I believe in, parliaments. Um, but politicians do things that they don't have time to be, think up imaginative new possibilities. That's the job of social entrepreneurs, academics, intellectuals, writers, poets, artists, it's, and society in general. It's our job to work to imagine how to solve some of these problems and then put them in the hands of the politicians and find the politicians who will implement them. I don't think they're going to solve these problems. I don't think it's their job to solve these problems. I mentioned that my grandfather was involved in the, in the post-war Labour government in the United, in the United Kingdom. Um, the programs they implemented, raising the school leaving rage, developing the welfare, the, the health, the, the national health system, uh, improving uh, labor protection, strengthening unions, all of those were the result of the intellectual work of people like the Fabian Society, which had been going on for 30 or 40 years before they came into government. And we need that. We need all of us to be thinking hard about how we're going to, and 
the thing the Fabians did, because they were socialists, uh, they uh, listened to working people. They asked them what their needs were, what they thought their needs were. They didn't necessarily agree with them, because not everybody understands their own situation perfectly, but they wanted to know what, uh, you know, of, of the leaders of the post-war Labour government, several, sort of three out of the big five, were people who had not finished high school. Uh, how many people in our legislature have not finished high school? And I, I could point to Trenton, I could point to Washington. Uh, we need to listen to one another, I think, to solve these problems. And I don't blame the politicians for not implementing policies that no one has proposed. It's not their job to come up with policies, I don't think. It's, it's, it's the society and intellectuals and, and academics and people produce ideas and then we try and implement them. So I don't blame the politicians. It's been our pleasure to listen to you. Well, thank you.